Now, the passage of Scripture that I'm going to preach from today, there was a time in my life that I couldn't stand this passage of Scripture. I wished that it wasn't in the Bible. I was a young pastor. I was on fire for, or I was a young Christian, really, on fire for God. I hated compromise. I hated anything that looked like compromise. I didn't like people that didn't want to like belly up to the challenge. And if you weren't ready to just have your head lopped off for Jesus, I really didn't have a use for you. And, I, you know, I had that zeal and I had that passion. And then one day I became a pastor. And when I became a pastor, I started to understand that unity is not the easiest thing to produce. You know, we want to be in one mind and one accord and whoa. And then we have our individuality, different opinions, different ways of understanding things, different ways of interpreting things. And I also learned that there's a lot of good people. Say good people that can disagree on certain things. And it doesn't mean that they're not good people. Are you with me? And so Paul, Paul said it like this in Ephesians 4.3. He said, make every effort to keep the unity of spirit through the bond of peace. <laughs> unity takes effort. So many folks, they come into the church, either they get saved or they come from another church. Maybe they've never been into a, a place that's had worship like this and the Holy Spirit's touched them. And they're like, oh, this is so wonderful. We're just going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya and everything's going to be okay. We're just going to love each other and everything's going to flow. And they're thinking, Kumbaya, my Lord. And then somebody does something, they're like, well, I don't agree with that. Wait a minute. I, I was thinking this was a kumbaya church. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like this. You see, as we're going to look and see that unity is greater than mental agreement. We actually talked about that a few weeks ago. And that if we're going to be unified, we've got a major on majors rather than majoring on minors. Because I believe God wants to pour out His Spirit in this place. I believe God wants to send a, a move of God to this church. And we're going to have to be unified for that to happen. And it's easy to get distracted on things that don't matter and miss what God is wanting to do. Paul tells us it takes great effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. So let's read Romans chapter 14. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn there. And it says this. It says, accept him whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. Say disputable matters. Every man's faith allows him to eat everything. But another man whose faith is weak only eats vegetables. Then the man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not eat, and the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? For his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man considers one day more sacred than another, and another man considers every day alike. Each man should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special must do so to the Lord, and he who eats meat eats to the Lord. For he who gives thanks to God, and he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Why do you look down on your brother? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, and every tongue will confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. 
Therefore, let us, not, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. As one who is in the Lord, Jesus, I'm fully convinced that no food is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for him it is unclean. If your brother is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy your brother for whom Christ died. Do not allow what you consider good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and is approved by men. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Say peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats. Because his eating is not from faith, and everything that does not come from faith is sin. What does this passage speak to us about staying unified in the midst of disagreement? The first thing I want to draw your attention to is in the tribe, we must give the freedom to disagree. Say the freedom, freedom. to disagree. Romans 14, 1 says, accept one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. Now, Paul said we're not to qu quarrel over disputable matters. Well, what's it a dis disputable matter? Well, I guess that's disputable. <laughs> well, it means that the issue is disputable. That there's two sides to the issue, particularly scripturally. Let me, let me give you an example. From my life and family and friends and my personal network, I've looked at every scripture in the Bible that refers to alcohol, from Genesis to Revelation. And I'm fully convinced that I should not drink alcohol. However, I have some acquaintances and people that I know that know the Bible. I'm talking very well. They do their devotions in Greek and Hebrew. I mean, know the word have multiple degrees of giving themselves to the Word of God. And they go, Cameron, not only is it not sin to drink, sin is a, I mean, not a sin to drink, uh, alcohol is a gift from God. And I'm like, what are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> and they'll go, Psalms 104, 14 and 5. He makes the grass grow for the cattle and the plants for people to cultivate and bring forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens human hearts, and oil to make their faces shine, and bread that sustains their heart. And I go, well, man, that, those folks, they didn't have Coke back then. Any kind of grape juice will make you happy. And I say, what about the law of first mention? You find Noah, you find Noah drunk, and his children curse. And then they'll go back and forth. See, the issue is disputable. I'm saying these people that love God, the people that walk in the anointing, these are people that pray and seek God and do, devo do, do devotions and are, are connected to the Lord. It's a disputable issue. Now, compare and contrast that to adultery. There's no disputing that. It's consistent from start to finish. There's no room for interpretation. There's no room for interpretation with sex before marriage. It's non-disputable. You see, every truth is not created equal. Uh, they asked Jesus, what is the greatest of the commandments? And if there's greatest commandments, then there's priority to them. And Jesus didn't disagree with them. Jesus gave them the greatest commandment. And then he said the second is like that, that there's priority to truth. And some things are a higher priority. If there's a man that's dying on a desert island and I get a 
to give him one scripture, I'm probably going to give him John 3.16. I'm not going to give him, don't, you know, boil a goat in its mother's milk. <laughs> now, there's first level matters. Say first level matters. These are foundational doctrines, things like the Trinity, things like the deity of Jesus Christ, things like, things like the bodily resurrection of Jesus, things like Christ's atonement for man's sin, things like salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, the virgin birth, the inerrancy of Scripture, and the second coming of Christ. These are things that define Christianity. And you can have a good organization if it doesn't have these beliefs. It can be a great Rotary Club or a great Qantas Club, but it's not a church because it's not Christian in nature. Then there's second level matters. These are matters of Christian virtue and morality and sin that require church discipline. Say church discipline. Now, I want to say this, and if you've been through the membership class, you know this. We're a church that practices church discipline unapologetically. It's, it's in the Bible. And, I mean, we're not going to be, a, there's been times I've confronted, one time I confronted a person that was having an affair with a married man, and they got mad at me and left, and they were singing in the choir at another church the next week. And I'm telling you, it's not God. But there's things that the Bible tells us we can exercise church discipline on. So 1 Corinthians 5, 11 through 13, it says, Now I'm writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral, or greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. Now who's it talking about? Anyone who calls himself a brother. So I want to say this, if a person doesn't claim to follow Christ, there is no responsibility for them to live a moral life before God. Their issue is unbelief. And until they leave the state of sin and enter into a place of having a relationship with God through faith, there is no moral responsibility placed upon them. The sin of unbelief will be the thing that they have to deal with. Once they come to faith and take on the name of Jesus Christ and claim to be a disciple of Jesus, there is a moral responsibility that's placed upon us as disciples of Jesus. I like to say it like this. And let me read verse 12 and then I'll tell you. What business of, it, of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside God will judge those outside, expel the wicked man from among you. I like to say it like this. We judge the believing, not the heathen. <laughs> okay? And he, he names a few things. Sexual immorality, greed, idolatry. Now, if you're in Georgia, idolatry, mixing religions is not that big of a deal. If you're in Bangladesh, if you're in India, it's a big deal. Slander, drunkenness. Now, I want to say this. Under drunkenness includes pot. Now, every two months we do a membership class, and at least every other membership class, we have somebody come through and go, you mean we can't smoke pot? And these are folks who claim to be Christians. And I'm like, no, not here. And they're like, man, God grows it. You can smoke it. <laughs> and I'm like, try that with poison oak. Just see what happens. <laughs> that falls under the umbrella of drunkenness. Okay? Addictions that cause mental impairedness. Then also, Second John adds false teachers to the list. If anyone comes and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. Then uh, Paul adds to Titus, someone who's causing divisions in the church, warn a divisive person once, then warn him a second time. After that, have nothing to do with him. You may be sure that such a man is warped and sinful. He is self-condemned. 
Now, if you don't have fall under one of these eight categories, you're not under the process of church discipline. Now, you got some guy, I mean, I've been pastoring for a while. You got some guy that's been going fishing, and he's been pulling them out, and they're this big. And by the time he gets to church, they're this big. Okay. You don't go kick him out of the church. He's a liar. Get, her, get the sinner out of here. What does the Bible say? So if anyone sees a brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. 1 John 5, 16. If it's a sin that leads to death, it's a church discipline sin. You confront that person. You don't pray about it. You confront them in their sin. You call them to repentance. But if it's not one of those things, then you pray for them. And what will happen? God will give them life. Then there's third level matters. Issues of the mission of the church and the methods that it has. We talked about the mission of the church, so I'm not going to belabor this. But let me tell you, every church has a responsibility to win the lost. Every church has a responsibility to make disciples. Every church has a responsibility to mobilize those disciples into ministry. Every church has a responsibility to connect those disciples through fellowship. And every church has that responsibility to worship God without exception. Those things are not negotiable. You don't get to go, well, we're just going to throw out evangelism. You don't get to do that. There's the third level matters. And then there's fourth level matters, which can be disputable. Say disputable. Now, I'm going to say there's, there's some folks that nothing's disputable. They're always right about everything, which they're going to think I'm wrong about this because they're right. <laughs> But the scriptures acknowledges that there's disputable matters. Let me give you some examples. To consume alcohol or to not consume alcohol. And I'm not, the scriptures is clear, drunkenness is a sin. We're talking about extreme moderation. But there's folks that I know that will have a glass of wine at dinner every once in a while, and they've never been drunk a day in their life. I promise you, I know them. And then there's folks that, that can't do that. Let me give you another one. You're not going to throw me out of the church, right? Is Republican or Democrat? Listen, God's not going to check your political party before you get into heaven. And there's churches that align with both of those that they think God's going to. Now, I do want to say this. The enemy and the devil is ramping up the intensity on abortion. Okay? And it's murder and it's godless. And I do want to say, though, if you identify with the party that promotes that, you have a responsibility to be the salt of the light of the earth within that party to modify their position. Or the blood can be on your hand. I'm just saying. But God's not going to check your, your party ticket when you get to the gates of heaven. Let me tell you another one. Rock music. <laughs> There's folks. I mean, let me tell you. Some of the most angry vitriol that you'll hear Christians t talk about other Christians is other believers that listen to rock music. I'm telling you. They're like, those people don't know God. They're filling their brain with sin. They're doing all this stuff. It's Christian music all the way. I don't care if it's the sound of music. It's not Jesus. <laughs> Let me give you another one. Look. Let me tell you, I had a small group one time I about had a fist fight in here. <laughs> okay, not by here. <laughs> okay, that's some Harry Potter books. And I've had folks that's like, they full of the devil, full of witchcraft. We're going to kick them demonized people out of here. And I've had other folks going, there's folks that don't know how to, that it's just fantasy, it's not real, there's nothing to it, I don't believe anything to it, I have zero faith in it. And I'm like, whoa, brothers and sisters. <laughs> I 
The next one is what I call holy days and holidays. And as a pastor, this is one that gives me a lot of grief. I remember my first Sunday, I was in Cairo. I'd been pastor there. We'd never, I don't think at that point, I can't remember exactly, I don't think we had over 22 people at that point, my first, going into my first Easter. It's Easter Sunday, I didn't know what to expect. I mean, I just grew up going to church, it's Easter, you wore a white suit jacket rather than a brown one, you know, it was about all I knew. But it was Easter Sunday, I was a pastor, we had 22 people, we had 75 people at church that Sunday. Lost people, don't know Jesus from Adam's house cat. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this is great. I got to preach the gospel. They've got, so, got enough religion in them to hear the message. Do I believe Jesus rose from the dead on Easter? No, I don't. That's the day we celebrate his resurrection. And it's historical in nature. It's, tra- it's rooted in tradition for doing that. Now, that first Sunday... I had 75 people. I went out of the parking lot. I was floating high. We had some folks get saved. We had some, uh, I, don't know, I don't know if we had folks get saved. So correct me on that. But we had a lot of people there. Had a lot of contacts. A lot of things going on. And I go outside and there's a group that, you know, I mean, uh, like Easter, Esther, could have some pagan roots, pretend, you know, all that type of stuff. And they had flyered all the cars in our parking lot talking about how we were worshiping the devil by celebrating Easter and that we needed to repent. And I was like, my high went low pretty fast. Like, oh, no, I'm a first year pastor. I'd never seen anything like that. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, we've had people leave here. I remember we had Christmas. We put some Christmas trees up on the, on the stage. And folks came to me and said, I'm not going to worship here. Got them Asherah poles up on the, on the platform. I was like, now, I'll just give you a little background. Mediterranean fertility cults, the Old Testament, they worship Baal and Asherah. And an Asherah pole was usually set up in the, in the village square of Central Peace, and it commemorated man's anatomy because they're a fertility cult. And everybody in the village, and this is Old Testament, this is in your Bible, okay? They would go to the Asherah pole, and they'd have an orgy. And they would believe that the gods would see them. Uh, engaging in the sexual activity, and they, and they would bless their crops. It was paganism, godless. It lured God's people away. God usually told folks like Gideon and people to tear down those Asherah poles. Well, I mean, I wasn't worshiping Asherah around those Christmas trees. And there is a... <laughs> you know? And... There is a a cultural projection to to meanings to things, that things can have different meanings in different cultures and things along those lines. And I'm not saying that there's not things that are associated with winter solstice. I'm not blind to those things, but I think that that there's tradition and meaning has moved and different things along those lines. And I'm like, like, it's a good church, yeah. Uh, Have you seen miracles happen in this church? Yes. Have you seen signs and wonders take place? Yes. Do you, do you believe God's with us? No, you got them Asherah poles up on the platform. Okay, all right. Also, I'm just, I'm just, throw, I'm just being real, and I'm just teaching Bibles and giving you some life examples, okay? Like Christmas. I don't care about Santa Claus. We don't celebrate Santa Claus in our house. I don't believe that Jesus was born on December 25th. I believe it's the time historically that we celebrate the Incarnation. And, uh, but I know that lost people care about Santa Claus. And we did this, it didn't really work good last year. We had bad weather and I don't know what all went wrong. But the year before, we did breakfast with Santa. And we had 200 lost people come to our church that we had never seen before. And they were eating in the back and the line went all the way down this hall, went all the way through the lobby and all the way down the ramp of lost people that don't know Jesus, that need to hear the message of the gospel, that want to have breakfast with Santa Claus. Do I care about Santa Claus? No. 
Now, in the disputable matter pieces, what you have to navigate as a pastor is you got some folks, it's like, Jesus is the reason for the season. We've got to keep Jesus central to Christmas. And anything that's commercialized, we've got to throw it out. Then you've got the other, the other group of folks, it's like, there ain't nothing in the Bible about Christmas. It's false. It's fake. We need to throw it out. And then there's other folks like me that's more missional, is thinking is there's a cultural reality that's in place, and we need to leverage the culture to reach as many people as possible. And you've got to navigate those things. But what you've got to do is you've got to give people the freedom to disagree. Because when you don't give people the freedom to disagree, it's about control. And control leads to manipulation, and control and manipulation are witchcraft, and it's removed. It, it, it introduces the demonic. See, the relationship has got to be more important than the issue. People are more important. Second of all, in the tribe, we must maintain an attitude of love. See, an attitude of love. Listen to verse 3. Anyone who eats anything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God accepts him. Here's what Paul does. I love Paul. Paul's a wise old cat. You know what I'm saying? He's been in the church. And he's, what he does is he flips it. He says, hey, listen, check your attitude about the people you disagree with. And if your attitude is wrong, then you're worse than the people that you disagree with. You see, he says, check your attitude. Wash your attitude toward the people that don't agree with you. Because if you can't have an attitude of love toward them, then you're wrong. Man, I thought y'all would be jumping in the seats about that. I'm just joking. <laughs> Third of all, in the tribe, we must allow God to be the judge. Verse 10 says, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Who's he talking to? Believers. Why do you treat them with content? Contempt. For we will stand before God. Now, in 1 Corinthians 5, God says to judge your brother. In Romans 14, he tells us not to judge our brother. What's the difference? The difference is the disputable matters context. The disputable matters is you don't judge based on these disputable matters because they are going to have to give an account before God. And that should give you the satisfaction of knowing that justice will be carried out. In issues that don't require church discipline, the saints are not accountable to you. Now, in, if you have believers that they're committing adultery, if they're swindling other believers out of money, if they're mixing religions, then... There is a responsibility and accountability to each other, and you do call them to a higher standard. But in the disputable matters, they have to give an account to God. And if they are at liberty, then they need to engage in things that they are confident that they're going to stand before God. So if you do it and you know that you're going to stand before God and you're like, ooh, I don't want God to know about this, then you better not do it. But if you're like, yeah, this is right, this is good, I'll gladly give a holy God account to this, then you're at liberty. But Paul also reminds them that you will give an account to God about your attitude in actions toward other believers. So he slices it both ways. He says, if you do things and you're at liberty, you know you're going to give an account to God before. It. If you're fine with that, then do it. But if you're over here and you're upset at them that they're doing, knowing that you're going to give an account to God for your attitude and actions as well. 
Verse 13, but let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block, do stumbling block, or obstacle, do obstacle, uh, in the way of your brother or sister. Now, there's three things that, that Paul uses, and verse 13 doesn't have them all, but it has the first two. The first is a stumbling block. Say a stumbling block. Okay, the stumbling block is an action taken by a biblically informed believer that does not violate any scriptural precept or principle, but which a less knowledgeable or less mature believer might imitate in the way that violates his conscience. In the initial context, at the first part of the chapter, Paul is talking to Romans that are, that are buying meat at the market in Rome and throughout Italy. That, and the meat has been sacrificed to the false gods in the temple. And they've been dedicated to, to those gods. And these believers are going to the temple and they're buying that meat. And they're going, you know what? Meat is meat. I'll pray, I'll break the curse over it, God will sanctify the meat, and then we're going to eat. But you also had believers that had come out of that polytheistic system that said, man, I can't go to the market and buy that, buy that meat. Man, every time I eat that meat, I think of worshiping Zeus and Aphrodite and all of these things along those lines. It just reminds me of my past. It reminds me of all the bad stuff I did at those temples. I can't do that. And so, he says, don't do things that would be a stumbling block for the immature believer. Because he associates it with idols. Now, I want to say this. He doesn't say this about inherently sinful things. Like, for instance, adultery is always a bad example. It's always wrong. Meat, I mean, it can be, there can be some personal leeway in that. Like, for instance, just, just give you some practical application. You can go to a Chinese restaurant. It's owned by Buddhists. They might have a piece of, piece of fruit up there that they've, they've dedicated to that. Some folks, especially folks that have come out of that culture, come out of that background, and go, man, I can't do that. This is practically like me going back into Buddhism. And they should not do it. And there's some folks, I don't come from that culture, I say, man, I'm going to break, I'm going to pray this prayer, it'll break the curse off this food, and give me some sesame chicken. Also, so it's always a bad example. Let me give you another example of a stumbling block because it is a little abstract. When I, when I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I had long hair. I was a metalhead. I'm just saying. I had friends that joked around with me. They said, girls would die to have your hair. <laughs> when I was young, had to, I, I got, got saved. I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. One of the first things that people stuck out to me, is, I knew this brother loved me, and I, it wasn't like I got offended or anything like that. But the first thing they said to me was, you going to cut that hair now? <laughs> you going to get that hair cut? Now, let's use that example because it's traditionally been a thing. The Bible says it's shameful for a man to have long hair. There is a cultural interpretation of what long is that can vary from culture to culture just like modesty the bible says that women are to dress modest it can be different from culture to culture i've preached in africa where the women weren't wearing tops but if they showed their ankles it would be like pornography there's a cultural interpretation to that i'm not joking <laughs> <laughs> And so let's use the example of long hair. Person comes in, believer grows their hair long. Could it potentially be a stumbling block? Yes. If the other person thinks that it's wrong to grow their hair long and they're tempted to get to do it as well. Let me give you a, a, an example that couldn't happen. 
Let me give you an example of what would be impossible. Um, in Cairo, we started, uh, helped to start three Hispanic congregations when we were down there. And a lot of times we'd have joint services together. And if you've been in a Latino, Latino congregation, you know breastfeeding is like, boom, you know. You know, they pull it down, get their upper bag, leave it out, plug it on. And, if, <laughs> and I got guys in my church going, Pastor, did you see church today? <laughs> Now, it would only be a stumbling block for them if they were tempted to breastfeed themselves. <laughs> so that's the case. It would be impossible. See, it's got to be something that's, that you can do that they're tempted to do it as well. Like, for instance, in church, if a person has a glass, glass of wine at dinner, generally speaking, the folks that are most offended by that are folks that are not tempted to have a drink at all. Therefore, it is not a stumbling block to them. It's a distressor, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But the second thing Paul names is obstacles. Say obstacles. And an obstacle is, is something that's put in the path of other believers. An obstacle involves a believer exercising Christian liberty in a way that hurts another believer. Obstacles are problems for young believers. So let's say you're at, at Christian Liberty to drink. And you have a glass of wine and you've never been drunk before. Listen, I know folks that have had a, you know, that drink periodically. And they've never been drunk before. They don't have a problem with it. Now, if you have someone, if you go to Applebee's and you order a glass of wine and there's somebody from the church there. And you have somebody that's an ex-alcoholic that has fought and scratched. To get out of addiction, and you pull out a glass of wine, and they think it's okay because you're doing it, and you destroy their faith because they go back into sin, their blood is on your hands. You see, that's an obstacle. And what Paul's argument is, is that's not of love. Some believers might not be able to handle certain points of Christian liberty because of their background, because of where they came from. And your action would damage them. That's an obstacle. The third thing that he mentions in verse 15 is we don't openly do any action that distresses another believer. Verse 15, if your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ died. To openly behave in a manner that other believers have differing ethical or theological differences over, Paul says, don't do that in front of them. And I'll, I'll, I'll tie that in in just a little bit. So, you, so the dynamic in Romans is you have a few folks. You have... The pagans that are coming out of the religion that are convicted about going to the market and buying meat. You also have Messianic Christians that are Jewish that have said yes to Jesus. And they are, they're following Jesus, but they're still maintaining a kosher lifestyle. And so Paul is telling the Gentile believers, when you're with them, don't order pork chops. It's a distressor. There was a, a Messianic rabbi that used to come preach at one of the churches in, in Cairo. And he would, one of the churches, and he would come around to different places. And there's this, he, he came enough that just all the churches didn't take him out to eat, but sometimes families would cook for him. And there's this one family that cooked vegetable soup, and they had a big old ham hock in the middle of it. He's kosher, don't eat pork. And they ask him over the house for dinner, and he's like staring at this ham hock in his vegetable soup. And they say, Rabbi so-and-so, will you say the blessing? And he goes, Lord, if you can bless in the New Testament what you cursed in the Old Testament, I pray that you'll bless this food in Jesus' name. 
You don't do things that are distressors for other believers. Like Paul at, uh, would say, if you're at Applebee's with other Christians and you don't know who's there, then don't order a beer. It's a distressor. Don't do that. And if you do, if you distress other believers willfully and knowing that it will do that, then you sin when you do it. Not because having the beer is inherently sinful, but because you've distressed other believers. So as we prefer others above ourselves, which is what Paul is asking us to do. Paul is asking us to prefer others above ourselves. I think I missed that point, so i got to find that. <laughs> okay, so in the tribe, we prefer others above ourselves. This is hardcore Christianity because in the church, folks like things tit for tat. If you, if you do something for this ministry, oh, you better do it for my ministry. You're not going to play favorites for them. Do something for somebody else's kids, you better do it for my kids too. You tell where people are when you ask folks to prefer others above themselves. You can tell because like we, we'll park somewhere between 100 and between 100 and 120 cars every Sunday between the two services. And we only have 18 parking spots. And you can find out where folks are. I mean, you say, hey, could you, if you're volunteering, could you, could you not park in the parking lot? Could you park over here so we could leave the prime uh, places for either the elderly, the handicapped, or for visitors? And some folks, you ask like you, if you could inject them with leprosy or something. They're like, what do you mean? I got here first. And because I, if they want these good parking spots, they can get here first. I earned it. And I'm like, brother, sister, you got to prefer other people above yourself. Christianity is not about God being fair. It's about him pouring his grace upon us, and then we pour that grace upon other people, even though they don't deserve it. So in the process of preferring one another above ourselves. We don't put stumbling blocks in front of other believers. We don't put obstacles in front of them. And we don't cause distressors. Now, the next statement, I want to say something. It'll be shocking, but I want you to hear me out. In the tribe, we must know that in a few cases, that what is sin for one is not sin for another. Now, let me explain this. I, I, first, I know I'm treading on dangerous waters, but I need you to listen and not check out. I fully reject moral relativism. What is right is right, and what is wrong is wrong. And what is holy is what is holy. But God expects you to hold him in such esteem that if you believe that it's wrong, you don't do it. Even if he doesn't explicitly say, don't do it. So you go to the movies, you hear something that you don't feel is right, the Holy Spirit speaks to you, or you feel bad about it, say, so you know what, I'm not going to go to the movies anymore. If you do that, then you, you sin. So there's certain people will have certain uh, convictions, they'll have certain things that they feel is wrong, and if they feel that it's wrong, they shouldn't do it. Verse 14, I'm fully convinced, being personally persuaded in the Lord Jesus Christ, that nothing is unclean in itself, but anyone who regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. Paul says, no food, no drink is unclean. The dietary laws of the Old Testament have been fulfilled in Christ, and righteousness is given through Jesus. If you regard something as unclean, though, you sin if you do it. Now, Paul's talking to the two groups. 
He's talking to the ex-idol worshipers, and he's talking to the messianic believers. And he's saying, if you believe that it's bad, don't do it. But maintain unity. You don't break fellowship. On the other hand, he says in verse 16, Therefore do not let what you know is good be spoken evil of. Now rejo rejoice over them pork chops you're eating. <laughs> and don't let folks say that you're sinning if you eat them. Now here's what Paul says. He says, I want you to partake secretly. Now, let me explain this a little bit because this is, it can be this is nuanced as well. Like I said, I don't like this chapter. <laughs> okay? Hypocrisy is hiding something that you do wrong so you can project an image that you're better than yourself. What Paul is talking about here is hiding something that you think is right so you will not distress another brother or sister. There's the difference. So, let's say, for example, just, just here. You do Santa Claus in your house. You think, hey, I'm just playing a game. It's fantasy. I'm just playing a trick on them. I won't tell them the truth. Whatever. Then you got one group. It's like the rigid folks. Like, no, you're lying to your kids. Absolute lie. Thou shalt not lie. Bear false witness. You're doing it wrong. You need to repent. And then you got the other folks. It's like all Christmas is bad. It's pagan roots, it's ungodly, it's whatever. But you feel at liberty to do that. Then you don't stand on the front row and go, we're doing Santa Claus in our house this weekend. <laughs> because it causes a problem. You see, in, in, a, in our American variety of Christianity, we divide over everything. And we think, if you don't agree with me, down, bow, 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 down the line, then I can't worship with you. If we understood the premium that the New Testament puts on unity, then we would probably live differently and we would divide differently. Also, in the trial, we must know that big picture Christianity pleases God. For in the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. If you want to have a healthy tribe, then you've got to focus on the big issues. The issues of the kingdom are not eating and drinking and holidays and holy days. The kingdom is made up of righteousness that's imputed to us through Jesus Christ. Peace with God and with each other. Joy in life and bringing the kingdom through the power of the Holy Spirit. Big picture Christianity. And when we focus on the big issues, that makes God happy. It makes God happy. And when we focus on the big issues, then we're effective and we're unified. But when we folk make minor issues major issues, then we're divided. We've got to focus on the big issues. Look at verses 20 and 21. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything else that will cause your brother or sister to fail. In the tribe, when you're at liberty to partake, you need to keep it secret. Verse 22, so whatever you believe about these things, keep them between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. In other words, that if you're at liberty, you don't project that. It's between you and God. 
but you're mindful of other people. Nothing bugs me more. I know, and I know people are about to leave when they start saying this. I don't care what people think. I'll do this. I don't care what people think. That's absolutely unbiblical. Because we don't put stumbling blocks, obstacles, or distressors in front of them. But when they go, I don't care what people think. I'll just do whatever I want. I'll project it, no matter what happens. Then that's not of God. Listen, you go to a winery, you know, you have a glass of wine, don't peg it on Facebook. There's a winery here. Why? Because it can be a stumbling block, an obstacle, or a distressor. Don't take a picture of you, got a glass of wine in your hand, make it your profile pic. Why? Is it because you're a hypocrite? No. Because it distresses brothers and sisters in Christ. And what they think is important. Because we prefer one another above ourselves. Somebody said amen. Yeah. Now I do want to say this. I want to say a few things about alcohol. There are people who make good, they can make good arguments either way on if it's a sin or if it's not a sin. But I want to say this. First of all, if you, if you drink some and you're buzzing hard, then you're sinning. You don't need to do that. We're talking about extreme moderation. Also, if you're a leader, I encourage you not to drink. Why? Because I believe God's going to pour out His Spirit in this church. I believe God's going to do miracles in this place. And there's too much at stake to be led away and led astray by something that can be a very slippery slope. Alcohol is so much stronger now than it was back then. And these are things that you need to consider. Also, there's a, there's a precedent for leaders... Not drinking. The priests were not to drink wine and to go into the tabernacle or the temple. The Nazarites, when they were set apart to God, they were not to drink. There's a, there's a precedent that if you, want to be, if you want to go deeper in the things of God, that you need to lay that down. Also, if you're a parent, what you do in moderation, the children have a tendency to do in excess. And you need to be mindful of that. But the main point I want you to take away. I, I know I did just, just some Bible teaching and whatnot. But I want you to take away is this. Is that unity is going to be one of our top priorities here. And as our church grows, there's going to be people that have different quote unquote convictions or ideas. Or there'll be more disputable matters that can be brought up. And we've got to major on majors. Because love and unity are a higher priority than eating and drinking in the kingdom. Also, the unity in the, the scriptures is not just a theoretical unity. It's a relational unity. So there's different small groups. That some, some of them are starting night. We have different sets of small groups every night of the week. So whatever your schedule needs, we got one. But don't just have a theoretical unity. Have a real unity. Also, there's things that the Lord's calling us to, like, you know, we're in the process of building the building and giving and doing all the stuff, and it's not about a building. It's about lives changed. It's about the body of Christ. It's about us getting a tool that can help us. But to get that tool, we'll have to be unified. We'll have to be in it together. 
And I'm asking you to, to make a commitment to unity. Step up.